welcome. And thank you for joining today's webinar, Strengthening the Bench of Principles, Evidence and Examples from Universities, Districts, and States, sponsored by the Wallace Foundation. I'm Frederick Brown, the Chief Learning Officer and Deputy at Learning Forward, and I'll be your moderator for today's event, which will end at 2.15 p.m. Eastern Time. By the way, we have over 800 registered for to discuss the discussion today, and many of them are joining us live. So first of all, a bit of housekeeping. As many of you may have already seen and heard, this session is being recorded. Both the recording and the slides will be available at wallacefoundation.org by Wednesday. You can also download the studies on Wallace's website and the websites of the Learning Policy Institute and RAND. For best viewing, we suggest you select speaker view at the top right corner of your screen. And to ask a question, use the Q&A function. If you have any technical issues, please email events at thehatchergroup.com. Now to our agenda. If you're involved in K-12 education, you know that principles matter. And recent research demonstrates that effective principles matter even more than we thought. High quality principal preparation and professional development matter as well because they can help principals to develop and hone the skills they need to be effective in their crucial roles. And that's why we're delighted today to share with you two new studies from Learning Policy Institute and RAND on how to make sure their principals have the kind of preparation and professional development they need to help them be effective, support teachers, and contribute to student achievement. We also have a wonderful panel of practitioners and policy experts to discuss the implications of the research for both practice and policy nationwide. And after the discussion, we'll take your questions. So again, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can. Now we wanna share findings from the just released report, Developing Effective Principles, What Kind of Learning Matters? And I'm pleased to introduce Marjorie Wexler, Principal Research Manager at the Learning Policy Institute, who will be joined by Stephanie Levin, Research Manager at Learning Policy Institute. But right now, I'll turn it over to you, Marjorie. Thank you so much, Fred. It's nice to be here today. There's a substantial body of research that shows principals to be a critical influence on student achievement, graduation rates and attendance rates, teacher satisfaction and retention rates, school climate, and more. These positive outcomes are associated with principals who effectively set direction, develop staff and support their instruction, effectively manage and improve their schools, and build positive environments for students and teachers. A critical question then is how can we prepare and develop principals who are effective in all of these areas? That was the focus of our study. We wanted to understand the features and outcomes of high quality principal learning opportunities. To do so, we conducted a comprehensive review of the literature since 2000. To understand principals' access to high quality learning, we analyzed survey data from a representative national sample of principals and from statewide surveys from California and North Carolina. We also reviewed many articles, books, and policy reports to understand the role of federal, state, and local policies in shaping principal learning. So what did we find? First, there is a growing body of research that shows that high quality principal preparation and professional development are associated with positive principal, teacher, and student outcomes. And this is especially the case for well-constructed and carefully implemented programs. Not only did principals develop confidence in their leadership abilities, they adopted more efficacious practices. High quality principal learning was associated with teacher outcomes, such as higher teacher retention rates, and with student outcomes, including achievement levels and graduation rates. The next question is, what are the elements of professional learning that are associated with these outcomes? On this slide, you can see the theory of action guiding our study. We found that what principals learn matters. That includes instructional leadership, which means knowing how to develop students' higher order thinking and how to select effective curricula and materials. How to improve schools by doing things such as using data to inform continuous improvement. 
how to establish positive school conditions for students and teachers by creating collaborative work environments and working with school and community stakeholders. They need to learn about staff development and how to help teachers improve and meeting the needs of all learners. Research has found that applied learning activities such as action research and reflective projects such as cross-cultural interviews can help aspiring principals develop knowledge about how to meet the needs of diverse student populations. We also found that in addition to what principals learn, how they learn matters. Especially important are applied learning opportunities such as inquiry projects or field-based projects based in real schools. Internships are important where pre-service principals take on the responsibilities of a leader, such as decision-making or leading staff development. They learn from expert coaches or mentors who can provide support and guidance. And being in cohorts or networks is also important, having a stable group of professionals to learn and grow together. So we know what makes for high quality learning, but do principals actually have those learning opportunities? We found that in their preparation, most principals do have at least minimal access to the important content areas that I described. And access to this content has increased over time. Principals certified in the past 10 years were more likely to report access to important content than more veteran principals. And this chart offers some examples. However, even with these improvements in access to content, not many principals had access to the authentic job-based learning opportunities that the research has identified as being important. For example, only about half had experienced internships with administrative responsibilities and coaching or regularly participated in a principal network. We also found that access to strong principal preparation is not equitable, that access to high quality preparation varies by school poverty level. This chart shows examples of differences in access to important content. And we also found differences in access to the high leverage strategies I discussed, the problem-based learning, the coaching and principal networks, which raises the question, how can we equalize access to high quality principal learning? So my colleague, Stephanie Levin, will now discuss the role of policies. We've learned from our research that state and local policies can support high quality principal learning opportunities and access to high quality programs. As one example, let's look at California. Between 2011 and 2017, California changed its licensure and accreditation policies. It integrated the new National Professional Standards for Education Leadership developed by the National Policy Board for Educational Administration with input from 30 groups across the country. They also have state standards emphasize educational diverse learners developing staff and involving stakeholders for school improvement. Administrative performance expectations were then translated into program approval standards and new expectations for both pre-service training and induction. Later, they were translated into an administrative performance assessment. These changes guiding program approval and induction were associated with changes in principals' perceptions of their preparation. As shown on this slide, more recently prepared principals in California had greater access to learning about key topics than veteran principals. Also, more recently prepared principals felt significantly better prepared than veteran principals in virtually all the content areas, with very large changes in instructional leadership, the ability to lead school improvement, the ability to meet the needs of diverse learners. Newly graduated principals were also more likely to have been exposed to problem-based learning approaches and field-based projects that were part of the new program expectations. In another example, comprehensive changes in Illinois produced substantial changes in principal preparation programs. The state established a PK through 12 principal endorsement designed specifically to prepare principals to address leadership challenges. Requirements included formal partnerships between principal preparation programs and districts, rigorous selection processes, a year-long internship, and competency-based assessments. Researchers documented a number of positive changes. These included stronger partnerships, targeted recruitment and enrollment, curriculum focused on important content, greater attention to diversity, high-quality internships, and a focus on continuous improvement. 
So we know policies can make a difference, but to what extent are states enacting such policies? Some of the key policy levers controlled by state agencies are program of approval or accreditation and principal licensing. The University Council on Education Administration, or UCEA, developed criteria for assessing state policies based on the research. In UCEA's 2015 review, they found only two states met all five of the high leverage criteria. 11 states did not meet any of the high leverage criteria. And states are more likely to legislate requirements for principal licensure than for a higher leverage program approval. Our research suggests several implications for policy. Stronger use of licensure and program approval standards can help ensure that programs include the features of high quality programs. Policymakers can require quality internships and encourage applied learning opportunities accompanied by expert coaching and mentoring. There's a need for stronger state infrastructure for principal professional learning. States can fund leadership academies and paid internships using state investments and federal funds from ESSA Titles I and II and the American Rescue Plan Act. And to ensure greater equity, we need to make sure that aspiring and current principals learn how to support diverse student bodies. We also need to make sure that principals who work in high poverty schools have access to high quality preparation and professional development. States can direct, can direct professional development resources to those schools or districts and underwrite high quality preparation for prospective principals who will work in those schools. We need to build local pipelines that start with identifying teachers with strong leadership potential and carry them through their preparation, providing strong mentoring and induction and continuing with high quality learning opportunities. Finally, as a field, we need to grow our understanding of high quality principal learning by broadening the spectrum of outcomes measured, accounting for factors such as principal's prior experiences, district content and program implementation, and using mixed methods to understand program processes and effects. Access to professional learning matters for principal success and retention and that of the teachers and students in their schools. The key question is whether we can create and sustain policies to enable ongoing high quality professional learning. And will that, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Fred. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Marjorie and Stephanie, of course, as you can imagine, just wear my learning forward hat for a minute, how important it was to hear that the equity issue around professional learning and access to effective professional learning. So really appreciate all the points that have been made uh, up to this point. And so now we're going to return or turn to that question of how universities, by partnering with districts and states, can actually design and build more coherent programs with authentic clinical experiences that prepare principals for the real world challenges that they will face. So I'm excited to introduce Becky Herman, senior policy researcher at RAND, to share findings from that study, redesigning principal preparation programs. So Becky, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Fred. We appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about the findings from the study of the University Principal Preparation Initiative, or UPPI. To set the context, many university-based principal preparation programs have struggled with how to make the fundamental changes needed to prepare principals for today's schools. To test a path forward, the Wallace Foundation provided grants to seven universities and their partners to redesign their programs in line with research supported practices. Under UPPI, university programs in purple on the left collaborated with district partners in green on the right and state partners in orange with the goal of improving the programs and principal effectiveness. The program redesign focused on elements of effective principal preparation programs identified in prior research as we've just heard, such as coherent curriculum, integration of theory and practice, active learning, supervised clinical experiences that are linked to coursework, active recruitment and selection, and a cohort structure. This work was supported by partnerships with mentor programs. These are preparation programs which previously went through a similar redesign and embedded in the state policy context around program improvement. Together, these elements showed the importance of treating program redesign as systemic change. Here quickly are the seven UPPI programs. Two previous UPPI study reports shared findings about the initial year of implementation and the state role respectively. 
The final report, which we are discussing today, is actually a suite of five reports, a full report with technical details, a brief report that summarizes the main findings and implications, and three targeted reports to be released later this month, highlighting findings most relevant to principal preparation program leaders, district leaders, and state education leaders. This suite of reports draws on over 630 data collection activities. The overarching finding from this study is that significant change around research-based practices in principal preparation programs is possible. In specific, the study found that UPPI teams improved program coherence, actively engaged partners to drive the redesign, and played out the redesign features across other programs, districts, and state policies. We'll start with the changes within the programs. The redesigned programs were characterized by a framework of core principles, more deliberate sequencing of courses to better scaffold learning, alignment to standards, more intentional and personalized clinical experiences, and instruction that applied classroom content to real job requirements. Altogether, these changes resulted in greater program coherence. Programs and districts together made recruitment more purposeful. Districts reported being more involved in helping the programs recruit promising candidates likely to become successful leaders, in part through the use of performance-based tasks. Candidates traveled through the redesigned program in cohorts. Principal candidates in the programs reported that their cohorts supported them through the program. And the instructors reported that they could build on the learning from prior courses because candidates had had similar foundations. Next, we'll look at how UPPI programs leverage partnerships in the change process. The four main types of partners played active roles. University-based UPPI staff managed the work and typically led both the steering groups, which set the direction of the initiative, and the working groups, which created the program by, for example, designing the new courses. Most districts led the leader tracking system development and engaged as peers in the, both the steering and the working groups. Most state partners provided policy guidance and convened statewide events around UPPI learnings. All state partners served on the steering committee, but only some teams included state partners on the working groups. And mentor programs served a variety of roles from thought partner to TA provider, depending on the needs of the program and the phase of the redesign. UPPI team members reported that having a committed team dedicated to the mission was a major driver of the work. One of the strategies that seemed to help was working together on quality measures, a program self-assessment. The process of developing a common vision for the program was also important. UPPI teams emphasized the importance of having some tool, whether it was a logic model, a theory of action, a conceptual framework, to develop and communicate the essential ideas of the re redesigned program. Mental programs also helped the partners focus the work. While all UPPI teams ultimately redesigned the full program, each site took a unique approach to sequencing the work, as you can see in the range of patterns on this timeline. As the design phase wound down, UPPI teams began to focus more on implementing the redesigned program. Several features emerged as useful for implementation, ensuring the instructors understood the design and the intent of the program, holding coordination meetings and professional development for instructors to maintain quality and consistency across course sections, and establishing coordinators or cohort directors to facilitate organizational collaboration. Teams baked in procedures for continuous improvement by collecting and analyzing data, recognizing that this was not a one and done process. For example, one program wrote, built semester end meetings into faculty responsibilities to review the data and tweak the program. To institutionalize and sustain the partnership and the critical program features, some universities made coordinator roles fully funded positions established external advisory groups, and created guides and other documentation. District and program staff reported that working together became a 
a part of their job. An important element of continuous improvement was the leader tracking system, which is a database with longitudinal, longitudinal information about current and aspiring principals. The LTSs were designed to provide data on graduates to inform program improvement. They also served additional purposes, for example, helping districts develop potential leaders and hire and place leaders. Next, we turn to how the UPPI redesign reached beyond the original partner programs and districts. Programs expanded the UPPI partnership to include new districts. Universities also developed new programs for other stages of the principal pathway, such as programs for teacher leaders. Partner districts applied the principles from the UPPI redesign to their district policies, such as leader standards and evaluation. Most UPPI districts also created new courses for teachers, teacher leaders, recent program graduates, or principal supervisors. State partners used their policy levers to promote principal quality, especially leadership standards, followed by principal licensure, program approval, and professional development. States organized events so that the programs and districts could share their experiences and approaches with their peers. Programs and districts also did this mentoring on their own. Now I'll turn to lessons learned, looking across program change, the change process, and extending the work. UPPI teams faced common challenges with collaborative redesign, and they developed viable strategies to address them. The most commonly cited challenge was finding time to do the work. Some universities bought out faculty time, especially during that intensive curriculum development period at the beginning. Both university and district participants adjusted their schedules to find times where they could meet. And some districts made the work part of their day jobs, by embedding it in district strategic plans. Teams addressed staff turnover through staged onboarding, redundant staffing, and document libraries. Another challenge was the fundamental shift in the work of professors from owning their own courses to co-developing common courses. Programs help their professors adjust by engaging them in the development and by providing professional development and frequent instructor meetings. In many cases, the programs shifted some or all of the courses to adjuncts with recent school leadership experience, sometimes transitioning tenure track faculty to PhD level courses. In closing, UPPI provides a model and a structure for redesign. Each UPPI team invented unique approaches and solutions that fit their context. However, common strategies also emerged. Collaborative partnerships are key, as is having clear and ambitious shared vision. States, which were selected for UPPI in part because of their prior work at school leadership, strengthened their principal policies. And teams need to find that balance between consistency and flexibility. Thank you for joining this conversation and we look forward to the discussion. All right, well, thank you, Becky. Uh, appreciate those recommendations for how universities and states uh, and districts can effectively work together. Uh, and we'll look forward to uh, continuing this conversation. Uh, and I'll just say this, uh, just as a reminder, everyone will get access to the slides uh, and the recording. So that will be something that will be coming forth as well. So we hope we'll, you'll take time to learn more about these and other studies. But before we dive into our discussion, let me just recap some highlights from both presentations. First, it's clear that high quality principal learning matters. And it's at universities, districts, and state policies, they all play a role in providing it. And that's a very important shift in the thinking. And also thanks to two decades of research, we now have a much better idea about what content and learning approaches are especially effective. So it's great that high quality learning or opportunities for principals learning are now more widely available, but access remains inconsistent and varies by state and school poverty level. And that makes principal learning, as I said earlier, an issue of equity. Now, fortunately, we've seen that states and districts can take steps to boost access. States, for example, can update their leader standards and strengthen program approval. Districts, for example, can collaborate on identifying candidates and create comprehensive aligned principal pipelines. 
and universities working collaboratively with states and districts can redesign their programs to be more coherent and research-based, making the work of the seven universities and the university principal preparation initiative a model for others. So before I bring out our panel, I just want to, again, the PowerPoint recordings will be available so everyone will have access to those. But I'm excited that we have a panel of folks who can help us dive into this a bit more. Uh, I'm going to be joined by starting with Peter Zamora, Director of Federal Relations, the Council of Chief State School Officers, Dan Dominich, Executive Director of AASA, the School Superintendent Association, Daniel Reyes Guerra, the Associate Professor at Florida Atlantic University and a Project Director for the University Principal Preparation Initiative's work at FAU that we just heard about from Rand and Rashonda Tyson, Assistant Principal, University High School for Science and Engineering of Hartford Public Schools, and a graduate of the University Principal Preparation Initiative Program at the University of Connecticut. So Peter, I'm, gonna, I'm coming to you first, just thinking about the role of state policy. Uh, and what is CCSSO doing to advance leadership? And how might these findings influence what states do? And I want to give you about two minutes uh, to respond to this question. So thank you, Fred, and very glad to be here. Uh, so for those who may not be familiar, CCSSO, the Council of Chief State School Officers, we're the national nonprofit organization representing state leaders of K-12 education systems. And we have a long history, much of it in coordination with the Wallace Foundation, of supporting states and ensuring that all, all schools are led by effective and well-prepared school leaders. So CCSSO worked in partnership to develop the professional standards for educational leaders, which are standards for practicing district and school leaders. And we also helped to develop the national educational leadership preparation standards, uh, which are standards for the preparation of aspiring school and district leaders and the accreditation of leadership preparation programs. Um, we also advocated for the optional reservation of funds. I think we heard it referenced uh, just briefly uh, not too, too long ago um, on uh, state leadership in the Every Student Succeeds Act. And so we're helping states to take advantage of this opportunity. And we run a collaborative of state K-12 leaders who meet regularly and coordinate on school leadership strategies. So the research today really supports CCSSO's work in this space and will help to inform it in the future because we've long recognized that effective school leaders are an essential element of good schools, that state policy is a critical lever, and that high quality preparation is necessary. And that's particularly true today as schools are working to address the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on our yeah. students. Absolutely, and Peter, I wanna stick with you just for a little bit longer and thinking about federal policy which in part we know governs what states do. And so what are the implications of the LPI and RAND studies for federal policy? Thanks, Fred. So yeah, there's a lot of activity that's currently underway in states. We heard some of this referenced in our presentations, um, including some good uses of the federal COVID relief funds that Congress provided um, and states are leveraging these to support school leaders. So just a few examples. Um, of leveraging these federal ESSER funds, um, that Florida is supporting elementary school principals and assistant principals to help them focus on improving literacy. Uh, Illinois is using COVID relief funds for competitive grants to provide mentoring services to all new principals in the state. Uh, Kansas is using uh, federal COVID relief dollars to implement a leadership training framework for the state's educational leaders. And Nevada is supporting a principal's leadership network, a school improvement network for principals and teachers, and a rising leaders network for education leaders from historically underserved groups. So the research described today will inform these ongoing efforts to promote effective principal pipelines, uh, including uh, federally funded initiatives. And of course, it will also serve to influence uh, future uh, federal policy development. So as Congress considers legislation uh, to strengthen educator pipelines, such as the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act or the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, we will encourage it to learn from the research and from the practical experience in the field as it, as it considers making some changes in this space. 
because I think while we're uh, encouraged by the improvements we're seeing in leadership pipelines in recent years, we really need to build on these improvements moving forward. Oh, I like that, a cycle of continuous improvement. Uh, so I want to turn to Dan then from AASA, Dan Dominich, for a perspective on the role of the district. And so Dan, do we see a difference in school performance when principals participate in, and I know this is a, I'm, I'm lobbing you a, a, a an easy pitch here. A softball, a softball. Yeah, softball, there's the term. <laughs> but are, are we, what do we see when it comes to their participation in, in PD activities? Absolutely, Fred. I think one of the, uh, uh, I mean, it's so much, it's so much of it is common sense uh, that uh, you, you need to have the, the additional professional development experience. You know, it's not like in the old days that you got your degree and you were done. Uh, teacher graduated from school and they were a teacher and nothing else needed to be done. Same thing with principals, same thing with superintendents. And what we have learned, and certainly the research that we have here, uh, is proof of that factor. And by the way, I want to take the opportunity to compliment the Wallace Foundation. Uh, a lot of this work has been done thanks to the Wallace Foundation. And I personally benefit tremendously when I was a, a superintendent in Fairfax County, Virginia. I was one of 12 superintendents that was the initial group that participated in this ad professional development, leadership development effort on the part of Wallace. So thank you, Wallace, uh, for giving me that opportunity. But yes, we see from in districts, there's no doubt that the districts uh, that engage and support, and by the way, this is key, uh, the district has to support uh, this professional development activity and has to encourage their leaders to participate in these programs and work with the universities to make sure that there's a collaborative effort because the results are, are, are there. Uh, uh, the research that we were shown today clearly show that principals that have gone through this kind of training, uh, that it has an impact on the performance of their students in the school, that it has an impact in the way that the staff feels about the work that they're doing and that they become role models for implementing the kind of practices that we know make a difference. So there is no doubt at all uh, that uh, this kind of activity is essential, it's important. The biggest problem we have, Fred, is equity. Unfortunately, as it is the case with everything else in education, the districts that have not uh, are not able to provide the, their leadership with these kinds of experiences as much as uh, the wealthier districts can. So clearly, uh, that, that's a factor that's there, that equity factor is there. And and, and we need to correct it. We can't allow our districts uh, that don't have the financial resources alone uh, without the ability to provide uh, their leaders with the training that will make a difference in their schools. But, you know, Dan, you brought back such good memories of generation one from the Wallace <laughs> uh, leadership work. Uh, many of us have fond memories there. And you, but you're also talking about what happens in districts and once folks are on the job. Let's go back a bit and look at the pre-service experience because we heard from RAND or LPI about the importance of authentic on the job experience for aspiring principals. So I'm curious, how do you see the importance of uh, the clinical experience in principal development on the it, it, it's 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 very important. Uh, you know, it's again as we have seen the change in the way that uh, we process professional development. Just sitting in a classroom or sitting in a room where somebody is lecturing you uh, doesn't do it. Uh, what does it is to have the ability to to be in a situation where you practice these skills to work closely with a principal. If you're not a principal yet, if you are a principal, to visit schools and work with principals that are uh, experienced in the particular areas that you want to learn. So mentors, coaches, the clinical experience, that one-to-one -one in working with individuals and experts that you can learn from and you can see, you're not just sitting there listening to the theory and you're practicing when you're seeing it. So that is very, very important. And we finally, frankly, you know, a lot of the surveys that were done, including the UPPI service, uh, one of the feedbacks that we got uh, at ASA from a, a lot of our principals that uh, when they didn't have that clinical experience, when that collaboration wasn't there between the college, the university, and the school district, uh, it wasn't happening the way it can and should happen. So you ended, right? You, you handed it off nicely to Daniel. 
uh, because I think that's the conversation we're going to have right now, which is. And by the way, their their school, um, may I uh -huh. say, I personally know w what their school is doing, and they are indeed a model. So, Daniel, thank you. <laughs> oh, see, that was a great setup for you, Daniel. So, Daniel uh, Reyes Guerra, who is the uh, who was participating in the redesign of that prep program uh, at FAU. And so as you hear all this, what, are the, what do you see as the benefits and results, as a matter of fact, as we just heard from Dan, of taking this collaborative approach uh, that we heard about from Rand? Well, let me start by, by thanking Dan for, for that lauding. Uh, much appreciated. We, we, and building really on that last comment about the clinical experience, one of the things, one of the big benefits in terms of the way that we uh, work to build our program was really bringing the district on board for that co-construction. And when you talk about the internships and the pieces that are really hands-on work, um, we designed using the administrative calendar and made sure that the principals and the district administrators were telling us both what happens when in terms of an administrator's uh, professional life and making sure that our activities were tied directly to that so that as they were going through the internship, not only were they doing real work, but they were supporting the schools that they were working with. Um, and this has been, you know, programs traditionally were uh, have been constructed and implemented by professors, university professors who use the research to create these programs, but this initiative really focused on bringing the stakeholders into the process, you know, and bringing policymakers and those who execute policy. Um, but like I said, most importantly, the districts who are the rep who receive uh, our students when they when they go out and graduate and go into the AP positions or principal positions. I think another benefit is that it was really important to include our state policymakers so that we heard their perspective because they see all districts and schools across the state, but also expose them to the ground level needs uh, for pipeline development um, so that they can blend that into policies that they are implementing on the state level. For example, in Florida, uh, this led to creating a whole new set of educational leadership standards and educational leadership program approval standards for both the universities and the districts. Um, and then we actually passed new legislation that governs how the state supports educational leadership professional development. Um, and I have to say, you know, repeating what you've already heard, Wallace, the Wallace Foundation was really important as a support. Um, for example, the latest report that came out in 2021 by Grissom uh, and, 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 and his other authors um, has been a real eye opener insofar as what, how we look at leadership. Now that we know, based on research, that principles can have an impact of up to three months of learning when they are effective in the school. This means that now state can think about, okay, resources should not necessarily all be directed just to the teacher in the classroom. We can have a huge impact if we're directing resources towards leadership development um, in, in the schools. Mm -hmm. So the other benefit that I would go after is the real partnership that was created with districts. Uh, we we co-created and implemented our programs um, and this really brought value to the learning. Joint decision-making was also taking place. We recruited and admitted students together. Curriculum was de developed together. Um, and we actually used, uh, as you heard from Becky Herman, we used district administrators, seated district administrators to become adjuncts in our programs. Um, our programs became very district specific, meeting the leadership needs of the district's context, as opposed to kind of generic learning that, you know, uh, meets the requirements of ed leadership, but not necessarily ed leadership in a specific place. And finally, the LTS system that was talked about, these were developed in different districts. They provided a real avenue for data exchange between the university and the district 
in terms of how these students were progressing and what that needed to change in our program, as well as their professional development um, in terms of what we were seeing in their performance. Yeah. Daniel, let me just, I wanna, because it sounds wonderful and the kinds of conversations you're having with districts sound like the exact type of conversations you wanna have, but how easy was that culturally at the university to make that shift in terms of how you engage around this work, how you plan for this work, how you, just can you talk a little bit about the cultural shift at the university itself? Sure. Uh, you know, in u universities, for us to make any changes, it, it, you, you start by going through multiple committees in terms of curriculum. It takes a year, year and a half to make any, any quick change. Um, and on top of that, you have this real um, ownership, I would say, that professors have over their own courses. Uh, you know, I teach law. I've been teaching law for the last 20 years. Uh, so therefore, what I'm teaching, it's my course, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to break that mold. You have to break that culture and say, we're teaching together. We're creating together. Um, and, and courses are no longer static. We can't have the same law course taught every year in the same way because of the differences that are happening, because of the new needs of the districts. So that had to be a cultural shift as well. And I think you heard from um, Dr. Herman, also the, the idea of what faculty do. So we were one of those institutions that did actually hire program coordinator faculty who would make this partnership with the districts real and focus on those programs as opposed to it being just a part of a faculty member's job. Um, districts are now our true partners. These programs that have been created are not FAU is offering a program. We actually have a name for each of our programs. You know, for with Broward, it's Propel, with Palm Beach, it's Exec, uh, with our northern districts, um, it is Elite. And they are their own organization that is that is populated by both faculty and by um, the district. So it really is a, a total shift in the way in the culture within the university and the way we do things. Well, I appreciate that perspective. And I know Rashawn, as you're listening to this as a graduate of a program and as a current sitting assistant principal, I'm sure a lot's going through your mind right now. And so I'm wondering, can you give us some examples, just a couple examples of things that you've learned in your principal preparation program that you actually put to use in your first month of being an assistant principal? Hello. So UConn prepared me well for the first month of school. We spent some time going over improvement, school improvement plans and actually learning how to create them. And that worked well with me in starting the school year and going over student learning objectives with teachers. So that was definitely practical. We spent countless hours going through the CCT rubric as well and looking at the differences between an effective teacher and a highly effective teacher. And that allowed for me to have meaningful conversations with teachers around the observation process and what it is that I would be looking for when I entered their classroom. And last but not least, I'd like to credit our family engagement course in not only helping me to plan an open house for our school, but also to think about engagement in terms that are different from what we know to be traditional, like, students or families are engaged if they come into our building, right? That course um, opened up my mind to reaching out to families in the community outside of them just coming into our building. So I'd like to say that UConn prepared me well um, to be an administrator. Nice. Uh, and I know, I know you're an amazing one. Uh, I can already tell. Uh, you. you know, we, and we've been talking about professional development a lot as well. And I'm just curious, how does your district's uh, PD program support you and anything you find particularly effective in that support? So our district does a great job of the, I guess I'll call them technical things that we need to know in terms of standards and best practices around instructional leadership and how to get our students to perform better overall. But what I'm really proud of that my district is doing right now is focusing on restorative practices and also 
excuse me. Um, and also focusing on uncovering people's biases, right? We all have some implicit biases and it is the work of uncovering those that will help us to be better uh, professionals, better toward our students, better toward our school community. And eventually that will um, lead to more um, student outcomes in terms of achievement. Oh, could not agree more. All right, thank well, thank you. you, thank you. So all of those who might be watching at this point might be thinking, so what can we do within our own sphere of influence? All right, so that's, imagine that's what the folks in the audience are thinking about. So for uh, Peter, Dan, Daniel, and Rashonda, what one minute of advice would you give to states, districts, universities that are looking to better develop and support principals? One minute, Peter, we'll start with you. Thanks, Fred. Well, I do think one of the key takeaways is around the role of state policymakers. And so, you know, building networks, engaging, you know, CCSSO, as I flagged, you know, works with networks of, of, uh, of state education leaders who are, you know, spend every day uh, really trying to advance this uh, body of work in their states. And so, you know, um, both sort of being informed by the research described today by your own practical experience on the ground, and then, you know, building relationships at the state level, um, I think is going to be really important. And then, you know, I manage the, the federal policy portfolio, and that same, uh, I think, lens applies around the federal policymakers. And so, you know, as um, you look to engage your, uh, you know, members of Congress, as you know, campaigns uh, start to engage, um, you know, there's a real opportunity here, and there's not uh, a sort of an immediate legislative vehicle, a bill that's moving right now that's going to cover this. But, you know, this would be the time to sort of build the consensus that we're going to need to get legislation across the finish line here at the federal level. So I guess if it's sort of one word, it's, you know, relationships. Relationships. Relationships matter. But Dan, I'm going to come to you with your one minute of advice to the states, district, and universities, but just with an extra nuance. And what about rural settings? So just your a secondary thought on that piece as well. Well, at the district level, for sure, Fred, it's, it's important for uh, the, uh, the the district to uh, plan, organize, and, and in collaboration with the uh, local universities, uh, put together a program, professional development program for their administrators, beginning with the classroom teachers, by the way. You, you need to create the pipeline. Uh, you, with the classroom teachers who aspire to be assistant principals, with the assistant principals that aspire to, to be principals within the district. That's key. I was able to do that in Fairfax County. And by the way, again, thanks to a grant from the Wallace Foundation. So thanks again, uh, Wallace Foundation. Uh, but it, 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 it's also important at the state level, uh, you know, that, that the standards and the policy, the rules and the regulations are, are set, that that indicate, and we've been very active at AASA and being part of that, that process, uh, that because so much has changed. I mean, think about the world today and think about our schools today. Two years, almost three years into uh, COVID, uh, it's a different world. So many things are, are changed so drastically. So whatever we were doing to train principals three years ago is out the window. It's a whole new ball game today. And, and that's what we have to focus in and come together. What are the needs? What are the skills? And how do we provide this kind of opportunity for our administrators? So again, in turn, they have the leadership to make sure that all of our students have the quality education that they're entitled to. And, and then any added advice for rural communities or those places that are supporting Rural is a very important, and it's a problem area uh, because of, 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 of the fact that they're so isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that we've seen working uh, with rural is to create uh, the kind of collectives in terms of a number of districts that form a cooperative that can work with uh, their university. Because here is not just the university in the backyard. Uh, here is a wide area where you only one university is providing the services and you have to create those collaboratives and that's working very well. Nice, nice, thank you. Daniel, how about for you, your one minute of advice? So I'm enjoying this because I can always build on what Dan says. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you that one of the, our experiences with our Northern districts is they are more rural and smaller so really quick, just to say those cooperatives, those consortium really make sense for universities because then we can bring together enough 
students from different districts to actually create good solid cohorts um, you know because in as, as a university we need those numbers as well so that's a really important piece but my 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 advice here would be one in terms of partnership make sure that your partnership with the district is a real profound partnership that you are working together on all levels on all parts of the uh, continuum of leadership within your district and that includes really important elements like having a really strong professional development piece around coaching um, mm -hmm. and really having um, a, a, a curriculum that can react to the differences that happen. Once again, what Dan just mentioned about about the changes that have happened in the last three years. We're seeing that social emotional learning, social emotional support has become really important for both students, but also for teachers and administrators. And then finally, really real quick, if you have a state organization, get together with the other universities and talk about what you're doing, hear what they're doing, figure out how to bring these innovations across all universities. Everybody needs to know what we're up to so that we can increase student learning across the state. So those would be mine. Powerful pieces of advice. So Rashonda, imagine you've got 800 people who are at universities, states, districts, hearing the advice that you would offer them. What would you say to them about all the things that we've discussed to help them better develop and support principals? So both of Dan stole my answer. Dan. <laughs> they, they both did. Daniel. In all seriousness, though, I've been thinking a lot about um, mental health, right? Uh, COVID has wreaked havoc on our students and our families, our communities in a number of ways. And we are seeing, um, I guess I call it the backlash of that in terms of student behaviors in our schools. So principal prep programs should definitely do something, whether it's a course or a seminar around mental health and like how to identify when certain behaviors are outside of what we know to be normal for students. And I'd like to underscore social and emotional learning for administrators as well. This time has been difficult for us. And, you know, we have had to do some self-care, um, but I think that the prep program should do that as well so that we could truly set the tone for our buildings and again, get to our bottom line, which is to make sure that our students prosper. Great advice. Thank you Thank so you. much. So I, I wanna bring back uh, Marjorie Wetzler of LPI and Susan Gates, senior economist at RAND and a co-author of the report on principal preparation and program design for some reflections on what the panelists just shared. And then we'll go to questions from the audience. So remember, audience remember, members, put your questions in the Q&A box, and that's where we'll look for your questions. But I want to start with you, Marjorie, just some reflections on what you heard. Great. Thanks. Um, and thank you, panelists. That was fascinating. Um, and I'd like to highlight, actually, um, in these few moments, what you said when you started, Fred, and what has been underlying much of what the panelists have been saying. Um, all of these issues that we've been discussing um, about principal learning, about the principal pipeline, are issues of equity. And it's critical that we as a field, as practitioners, as policymakers, as university um, faculty, as researchers, pay attention to these issues. Um, so policies such as providing paid residencies can open up the principalship to promising leaders from all backgrounds. Um, not just those who can afford a program, right? And we can open up the field while providing strong preparation. Um, states and districts can direct resources to high poverty schools um, to ensure that principals who work in those schools have access, the same access as principals in low poverty schools to high quality learning opportunities. Uh, pre preparation and professional development programs can include a focus on equity to help principals develop the knowledge and skills to meet the needs of diverse student populations. So these and other actions really support principals, support teachers, their schools, their students, and their communities. 
powerful points. Thank you. How about for you, Susan, some reflections on what you've heard from our panel? Thanks, Fred. Yeah, for me, um, what struck me is that each panelist talked about principal preparation from a slightly different perspective, but with the recognition that principal preparation is not something that happens discreetly within the university. Rather, it, it's a process that extends across the entire pathway to the principalship in a district before an aspiring leader even enters a program while they're enrolled in the program and concurrently working in a district most typically, and then after program completion. And, and through this lens, it's easy to see why a system perspective on prep program improvement is so critical. Uh, you know, I think Dan said it's just common sense, right? Um, so for me, the panelists' comments really drive home some of the lessons that we learned from our study of UPPI. First, the importance of engagement and collaboration among states, programs, and districts. And secondly, the importance of coherence. And when we talk about coherence, of course, we're thinking about coherence within the program across courses between clinical practice or, or clinical experiences and classroom experiences, but also coherence across that pathway between what happens in that program and what happens on the job. Um, our research found that leader standards, either national standards such as NPBEA or state standards can help create a common understanding about what's expected of school leaders. And it's that active use, not just the existence of the standards, but the use of them that's critical. Mm -hmm. um, we also found that developing a common vision for leadership unique to each partnership, as Daniel described, um, happened in Florida Atlantic University, builds coherence. This common understanding can drive coherence across the pathway to the principalship. Nice. And Susan, while you're, while you're speaking, some, a question came up from the chat just asking about, it came up during the RAND presentation on buying out faculty time. And the question was, what's that about? What does that mean and how does that look? Yeah, so I think what that's referring to is that faculty who would normally teach several courses in a given semester or year um, would be uh, given a break. Uh, maybe they teach fewer courses so that they could devote additional time to collaborate um, on the uh, the revisions to the curriculum. Got it. Got so they're not overwhelmed or doing this as an add-on. That makes perfect sense. And, and Rand, uh, Daniel, question for both of you. Just people are wondering how long does this take, the redesign take uh, at the university? And I'm sure it varies, but just would love some examples uh, from both of you if you could talk about sort of the length of time and and even sort of what it felt like maybe Daniel during that time for folks as you're going through that design redesign process. But maybe Susan first, any general sense of time across the various programs? Yeah, I think in Becky's presentation, she showed a timeline chart quickly mm -hmm. that kind of gave a sense of like, this was, you know, pretty much a four to five year effort with um, certain activities being revisited over time. And I think that's, um, that's also a key point to emphasize. This isn't a one and done. You know, you don't revise the program and then put a bow on it and then, you know, kind of put it in the closet. Um, all of the programs were uh, viewing this from a continuous improvement perspective and putting processes in place that could enable and sustain that continuous improvement. Um, but Daniel, I think you might be able to speak more specifically to, to how long um, individual pieces of this took. Yeah, so FAU, what we did is we actually established work groups that, um, that went through, and once we had determined, we went through a whole process using the standards to determine what were the courses that we wanted in, in this program. And once we determined what those standards were and we kind of bucketed them, then those buckets then turned into courses and we created work groups that worked on those courses. Hindsight, 2020, right? Looking back, one of the things that we had to make up for was some of those we did in isolation and didn't scaffold. So we then went after it again and in our continuous improvement have really made sure that all of our courses scaffold, build on each other as they go, as you go through the program. 
Um, so timeline to do that initial step was a good year. Uh, it was it was a year long process. Um, and then really we dedicate time at the end of every semester going forward to be constantly engaged in continuously changing um, our courses as we make discoveries along the way. Hmm. So in, in both case, as we're describing this, just a cycle of improvement and there are times that we go back and revisit. Uh, so Marjorie, a question for you then, because some people are wondering like, what's keeping people from just implementing these changes right now? Like what's, what advice would you offer for those who are asking that question? Well, I think one of the themes that we've heard throughout this webinar is the amount of work it takes to, of, of everybody working together, right? Getting, making sure at the state level that we have standards in place that have content that, for example, focus on equity, that for, for program approval that require that active learning, those internships, um, enabling universities, um, not there, you know, um, we were just talking about buying out the time, Susan was talking about that, but rewarding faculty, they're not going to be publishing, they're going to be doing other work that needs to be um, honored at the, at the university. Um, and getting in place the infrastructure that that is needed at the state level and at the local level to enable the coaching to occur where we can have coaches who are trained and who have time and, and time for brand new principals to actually have, you know, have opportunities to meet with their coaches. So it's not just popping in, but, but significant time to provide that advice. So I think there are a lot of pieces that need to get put in place but I think we know what those pieces are and we've seen it um, successfully implemented. So I think we can put together the pieces and improve support um, for principals, principal learning, and that's all. Nice, well, and it's such a sense of urgency, right? Like we all wanna get this work moving forward because we know how important uh, it is. So. Uh, great advice. And you, you were mentioning the coaching piece, but I want to tease out mentoring separately from that. And this is, I'm going to open this up, starting with you, Marjorie, and then others. So like, where are these mentors coming from? How do we develop a cadre of mentors to support principals in the job? Are they current administrators? Are they retired folks? Curious what kind of models you're saying? Marjorie, I'm going to start with you and then others. Dan, I'm probably going to come to you next on this one. Uh, and then we'll see where it goes. But Marjorie, if you kick this one off. Yeah, mentors are often retired. You know, they've been successful principals, administrators. They under, they have been there. They understand it. And we've seen successful models where mentors have training. They have their own support so that they can share ideas. They can share their tools. Um, support each other in the same way we're talking about principals supporting each other. Um, and there are things that we know about what makes for strong mentoring um, that's in the research I didn't get to discuss in the presentation today. Um, for example, you know, we know that it takes, as I said earlier, some, some significant time. You can't just fly in and out of a classroom. It takes a culture where the new administrators trust their mentors um, and they can mess up and know that there's someone there to catch them. Um, and, you know, good matches between new administrators and mentors. So I think there's a lot more that we, we know about. And I think there are a lot of people in the field when we talk about a principal pipeline, when we talk about the farther end of the pipeline, we have people who are skilled who can serve as those mentors. Thank you, thank you. Dan Dominic, I'm coming to you. Well, as you heard this from Marjorie, anything you would add from your perspective? No, I, absolutely. The uh, retired, particularly your outstanding retired principals uh, make great mentors because they have the time uh, and they can spend time in person with the individual. Let's say it's a newly appointed principal 
to have that mentor working with that principal and uh, in person going to the school on a regular basis uh, and also on the phone and at other times, that kind of a relationship uh, is outstanding. And I know the districts that are practicing are very happy with that. And, and the individuals that are retiring, I love it. Uh, and, and many of them continue to do it many years after they're retired because it's something that they, they love to do, they enjoy doing, they still feel that they're contributing. And the same thing with coaches, uh, you know, so hired administrators are great mentors, outstanding uh, coaches, and they can make a significant difference. And it facilitates the process, by the way, because here's somebody that can go to the school. Here's somebody that's available whenever the principal is available. It's not that the principal has to be taken out of the school or has to attend the program. This can happen and in person, in the building, where the difference is made. So that that's an outstanding practice. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And I wanna give any other panelists a chance to jump in on this question before I go to the next. Anyone else want to add to this conversation about mentors? And Rashonda, yeah, please. Yeah, so I had a clinical supervisor during the time that I was in UConn, UCAP's program, who then became my mentor during the school year. And mm -hmm. yes, we have, you know, formal meetings, let's just say they're the first Tuesday of the month. But what I really appreciate is the on the spot, uh, you know, my mental being ready for on the spot questions, because sometimes things come up. We do a thousand things in a day, right? We make a thousand decisions a day. So I appreciate those um, informal times, be it just a text message or a quick phone call. So yes, I would say uh, hire more retired administrators <laughs> <laughs> to be mentors for us. Great point. Thank you. And it sounds like that getting that right match is so important so that you can be vulnerable and have those kind of conversations that you need to have to really advance your practice. You know, uh, Peter, I'm, people are probably wondering, like, how do I find out if my state has a program that supports principal development suggestions that you have on where they should look? Yeah, I mean, I think we have seen a number of states, I just listed a few that are using their federal COVID relief dollars, and many state educational agencies have been uh, posting information around those expenditures on their, uh, their websites, on their SEA website. Um, also, ccsso.org, uh, my association is also um, publishing a, a bunch of different um, resources. Um, but also, you know, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't, you know, get the public kind of attention, um, but that certainly if, um, individuals at the SEA or at their universities or in the districts would um, know very well. And so I hate to sort of go back to this notion of kind of building relationships with state educational agency staff, um, you know, we're, we're very interested in engaging, um, you know, broadly. And so I uh, would encourage folks to find out what you can online, but then also, um, you know, reach out and connect with folks at SEA, so I'm sure would be glad to to um, coordinate. Great point. And, you know, this whole notion of getting the word out, you know, there, all of us have a different role that we play and getting the word out about this, these reports, uh, these findings and the implications for the field. I know just wearing my learning forward hat for a second as a communication partner with Wallace, uh, part of our role is to get this out in our publications and our social media and our blogs and elsewhere. And I'm just curious, uh, Susan, Marjorie, suggestions that you all would have for the field and others of us on how do we get the word out about these important findings so that they can actually be, there's, we can put the information to good use. And Susan, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, then I'll go to Marjorie and then I'll any, and then Dan, I think I'll come to you on this one as well. Susan, how do we get the word out on this? So I think one of the challenges about getting the word out on a complex set of learnings such as uh, have emerged from the UPPI stems from the fact that everybody who's interested in the topic is coming at it from a slightly different perspective. Um, so I would say, you know, I think convening a panel like this where you have representatives um, who can speak to it from each perspective and drive home what they found to be most relevant um, is a great starting point. And then using them as emissaries for their, uh, their group and, um, you know, really targeting the message, um, you know, because the questions that districts might have in their mind are 
going to be very different from the questions that um, preparation program, your preparation programs are going to think, well, how, how do I reach out to a district? How do I structure a meeting to make sure that they feel engaged? Districts might be wondering, you know, is this worth my time? Um, you know, what is a program going to be asking of me? Um, so I think targeting those, um, those lessons to the audience is, uh, is a good way ahead. Yeah, that's such a great point. You know, every time one of the members of the panel said professional development or coaching and mentoring, it was speaking to my heart coming from moving forward. And I can imagine as uh, every time Dan, anyone talk about the needs of superintendents and principals and how important it is to get this right, it spoke to yours. So Dan, before I come to you, I wanna hear from Marjorie though, like what other advice uh, would you offer us? Um, a couple other um, pieces of advice. Um, one, I know um, sometimes people don't have time to read the long reports. I know we have an executive summary. I know Rand puts out executive summaries and briefs. And so there are shorter versions that people can access. And I know we'll be creating more and I'm sure Rand will as well. Um, there are, are many uh, resources adjacent to these. There are these reports. There are other reports available on all of our websites. Rand has a wealth of information, Learning Policy Institute, um, all the organizations, Wallace Foundation, AASA, um, CCSSO. There are tons of, so go to the websites and see what addresses this specifically and adjacent, uh, as I said, reports and reach out, reach out. We are all passionate about this subject, about what we've learned. And if you need a resource or you don't understand something, reach out. And we were, we're you know, I'm sorry to uh, Susan, I'm sure is available also. I'm making her. <laughs> um, so there, there are ways to get that tailored information that, that Susan was talking about. Wonderful. And, and Dan, I'm going to give you the final word on this. You got 30 seconds. What's... Well, what? Fred, we, we work very closely with the two principal organizations, the elementary principals, the secondary principals, and together uh, we send out the message of how critical and how important this all is. Uh, and, and we work uh, closely with all of our colleges and universities in terms of creating these partnerships between the associations and the colleges and the universities, all in terms of, of trying to bring about the resources necessary, uh, the cooperation that's necessary, and the working together. And let me say that to me, this is the key in all of this, the working together, all of us that are here, universities, research, the various organizations. If When we come together, we're incredibly powerful in getting that message out and making it happen. Yeah, and I could not agree more. And I, I thank you all for coming together in partnership today. So Marjorie, Stephanie, Becky, Susan, Peter, Dan, Daniel, Rashonda, Thank you. What an insightful conversation and for pointing us on a productive path forward. And of course, a great thanks to all of you for listening and sharing your questions. Your interest is a powerful sign that we can build on the progress that we've heard about today. And as a reminder, again, a recording of this webinar, along with the slides, will be available at wallacefoundation.org by Wednesday. So I urge all of you who are interested to check out both studies. So on behalf of the Wallace Foundation, thank you again. I wish you continued progress in achieving equity and excellence for the young people we serve. Have a great afternoon.